A buddy of mine told me the story once of Jesus finding his bong. He grew up in a strictly religious home, a Jehovah's Witness home, no less, but somehow managed to be a pothead despite all that. So one day he comes home from school to find his dad sitting on his bed next to a bong and a tray with a couple buds on it. So his dad gives him the whole devil's weed talk or whatever, takes the bong and the weed, announces how long he's grounded, and then before he leaves, he has to tell my friend what a narc Jesus is, apparently. He says to him, he's like, in case you're wondering how I knew, the Holy Spirit told me to look in the top of your closet. Of course, this leaves my buddy wondering why the Holy Spirit didn't mention anything about the ounce of weed under his bed, but he didn't ask about it. Now, of course, what actually happened is dad got suspicious over some little thing that he barely remembered, right? He, he comes in on my buddy, closing his closet awfully fast. He hears something suspicious followed by the closet opening, something like that. Then he thinks to himself, hey, I should check my son's closet and see if he's got drugs in there. And when he finds the drugs he'd suspect that he might find, he retrofits that into a message from the Holy Spirit. The rest of us call this process thinking but for Christians, it's called receiving a message from the Holy Spirit. And as dumb as this is, Christians try to use it to prove their God to me all the fucking time. They'll say something like, you know that little voice in the back of your head that tells you you shouldn't be doing this? And then they act like they've just identified a God right there in my brain that I can interact with. Now, first of all, the voices in my head aren't places, Right. There's no back of my consciousness. The voice that says you shouldn't be doing this. It's in the exact same location as the voice that says, but it'd be an awful waste of lube if you stop now. And I'm sure that Christians wouldn't be as quick to claim that latter thoughts, divine authorship. But secondly, and more importantly, that little voice, that's me. I'm the culmination of all those voices, plus the bones and muscles and organs and shit that towed them around. The voice in the lower left corner of my brain or wherever that tells me I probably shouldn't do this is an amalgamation of all the moral teachings that I've internalized, my personal experience, and the back of the envelope calculation I did on how likely I was to get caught. It's not a thing in need of explanation any more than the voice in my head that says, should I pick up mustard or do we already have plenty? Of course, Christians can't admit that or they'd be unable to maintain the stiflingly low self-image their religion requires of them. I mean, as soon as you start attributing all the good thoughts you have to God, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that you're a piece of shit, right? As my friend's anecdote reminds us, this mythical ascription isn't limited to just the moral imperatives. Even a hunch that turns out to be correct gets rolled into the Holy Spirit. So what's left? Right, just the immoral temptations, unfounded suspicions, incorrect answers, and bad ideas. No wonder they're so convinced they deserve to burn in hell. And no wonder they assume that we're a convenient alibi away from murder rape all the time either, right? I mean, as low as their opinion is of themselves, their opinion of us manages to be still lower. But if you think the only way you know stealing shit is wrong is because a ghost is whispering it to you, it's got to be hard to trust the people who aren't listening to the whispery ghost. But I'd argue that the worst consequence of this isn't even the bigotry. Uh, imagine how terrifying it must be to not even have your own head to yourself. I guess, honestly, a lot of you don't even have to imagine it because you were religious. You can just remember what that was like. I, I, I vaguely remember it, too, right? I, I shucked off religion pretty early in life, but I still remember having thoughts like, but what if God doesn't exist? And then trying to chase him away in case God heard me doubting him. That has to be the worst consequence, right? The voluntary surrender of lines of inquiry. You know, God doesn't just get pissed when you conclude that he doesn't exist. He gets pissed if you even doubt it and he can hear your thoughts. So you better not even think about your religion being wrong. I mean, w when you look at the rebuttals offered up by Christian apologists, it's easy to conclude that they're incapable of thinking. But if you look at their doctrines, it all makes sense. It's not that they're unable to think about this stuff logically. It's that they're not allowed to think about this stuff logically or otherwise. And, you know, obviously this isn't a happy fucking accident. Think about how much Christian leaders love to highlight the thought crime parts of the Bible. They're constantly reminding prospective marks that even lusting after somebody counts like committing adultery does. Even hating somebody is the same as murdering them to Jesus. Thinking about something is just like doing it. So even thinking, but what if God doesn't exist, is the same as hammering Jesus back up on that cross all over again. But there's only one reason to dissuade someone from thinking, and that's because you're lying to them. And not even well, right? Not even lying to them good enough that you're confident about it. And hey, Christians, that voice that you hear in the 
northwest quadrant of your head or whatever that tells you exactly this all the time, that's not the Holy Spirit. It's you. And this is one of those rare instances when you're right. Right. 